We are looking at Genesis chapter 32. And I will begin in the New International Version at verse 24. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, we come to this word understanding that without the opening of our eyes and the enlightening of our minds, we cannot fully comprehend it. And so we invoke thy spirit tonight. Let the Holy Spirit come and speak to our hearts, and we shall give glory, honor, and praise to thy name. For it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. This is a story that is full of chicanery, but it is perfectly on point to show that things change when God steps into the picture. Our theory for this series is clear. When God steps in, there is a complete shifting of circumstances. When God steps in, it may seem imperceptible to those who do not see things spiritually, but it is never the same. It cannot be the same when God interposes his power. This family quarrel, if you will, begins with the, an understanding that in a mother's womb there were two nations about to come forth. When this mother knew that those two boys were stirring, I cannot speak with great authority about it. My wife tried her best to explain to me the things that were occurring when our children were aborting. In fact, I want to say to you with great pride that I empathize to the point where I sometimes thought I felt physical phenomena. But I do not pretend that I understand what this mother felt when she began to question what is happening and the answer comes from God. Two nations wrestle inside you. There would come from her these brothers who uh, while they were of one family would be nations that would never be at peace. And when they came forth, the first one comes red. In fact, red uh, goes into the nomenclature of history and becomes Edom. The Edomites rise from the color of the child, a red, hairy child. Uh, the situation is, is a strange one. The boy not only was red in color, but hairy, suggesting perhaps uh, something of his future. Uh, hypertrichosis, they call the situation, when there is an overabundance of superfluous hair. And so he comes forth red and hairy. Then comes this other child taking hold of the heel of his brother, and they name the boy because of what he does at birth. It almost seems unfair. For what does the baby know? Of what he does. But somehow this is an emblem of what Jacob will become. The name Jacob, uh, etymologists would suggest, begins with the thought that he grabbed the heel. He deceived, he tried to grasp or to supplant. So this child wears a name that suggests something negative. I think we ought to be careful what we name children. Some children wear names now. You know, we pass through phases where we give children names, and sometimes these books 
have some strange implications. You may go to all kinds of sublime meanings, but once you have chosen a name, the child is stuck with that name. And then some children come up with those nicknames. The name is perfectly good, but the nickname is strange, and a child must battle for the rest of the child's days with some odd nickname. But this child has an official name that means supplanter, deceiver. It's almost like having to wear a t-shirt all of your life, a, a tattoo, if you will, so that when somebody meets you and they say, who are you? You announce to them, I am a deceiver. What a burden to bear. And all of the psychologists and psychiatrists would go wild talking about what it means to carry a name like that, what difference it must make. The Bible suggests that as these two grew, there was a, a definite difference in them. Uh, Jacob was called a plain man. Now, plain, as it reads in the King James Version, is not necessarily what it turns out to be. Uh, plain would in fact seem to be that he was cultured and quiet in nature, uh, with a sense for economy, one who would prefer to stay nearby home and manage things with administrative abilities, not plain in that there was nothing interesting about him. In fact, quite the opposite was probably true. This man was possessed of an ability that seemed almost native. He was able to manage affairs almost as though he were born to do so. But the promise that came was simple. It came early to the parents of this child. The younger shall rule over the older, and there will be a great nation that will come from him. So the implications were clear. Despite the name that he carried, God had determined that something great would come of him. Allow me, if you will, to suggest that no matter what society may name you, no matter what people may call you, no matter what people may think when they look at you, God's ideal for you may be quite different than what your name might imply. I believe that there are too many people who, who look to secular society to find out who they are. There are studies that have been done to, to prove that if you look at television to find out who you are, you will normally come away with the wrong conclusion about yourself. You cannot trust people who don't love you to tell you who you are. You cannot trust news magazines. You cannot trust news commentators. You cannot trust what seems to be the ambience in society to tell you what you are about. Because if you do, you may conclude that you are nothing and will never mean anything. But God's plan for you can be counter to what your name suggests, or what people think about you, or what your situation seems to indicate. For God is not controlled by circumstances. Circumstances are controlled by God. It's important to know. Somebody listening to these words may have been told all of your life, you'll never be anything. You'll never amount to anything. But you've got to understand, that as soon as you accept somebody else's description of who you are, then you give them power to determine your limits. Evidently, Jacob, the plain one, was not one to accept what his name seemed to imply, but he thought beyond that. And as he meditated close to home, he understood what it was to have the power of spirituality. He knew what it was as he listened to Isaac, his father, talking about the power of God that was promised to the family. He understood what it was to have the promise of a redeemer come through the family line, and it was his determination that if he could facilitate it in any fashion, in fact, it was his desire to be connected with the greatness that was promised to the family to be a part of the Jesus, the Savior who was to come. Now, Esau, the red one, was not so inclined to think of things like this. In fact, uh, there are scholars who believe that, that Isaac was inclined towards Esau because Esau represented that little verve inside, that wild side of Isaac. Now, if I get close to you, it is intentional. 
The Word of God is not intended to be locked away somewhere antiseptically against society. The Word of God is intended to be applied to human life. It's for the here and now. There are times when you look at your children and see parts of them that kind of remind you of parts of you. Maybe you didn't have the nerve to live out some things, but you have one child who does it. And while you don't want to openly advocate this behavior, you kind of wink your eye and say, ah, come tell me about that. <laughs> this Esau was one who would go out to hunt and to trap animals. When he would go out, he'd come back with stories to tell. You know how it is with hunters. Sometimes I think they embellish their stories slightly. I have people in my family who pretend to hunt. <laughs> and I have listened to their stories, and I know that they are not completely true because they change over years. <clears throat> so can you imagine when Isaac is there and, and Esau comes back from the hunt? Esau, come, son, take a piece of venison and, and let's eat together. Now, you will find in the early days of this family, food played an important part. I, I don't want to make you run away from the television screen just now to get anything to eat, but let me take the risk of describing this to you. I understand that this very pottage that is so powerful in this story is something that they still eat in the Middle East made of red lentils with onion and garlic seasoning over rice with a little olive oil. <laughs> stay there, stay there, don't leave me. So, so perhaps Isaac would say, son, come and bring something of what you've caught and, and tell me of the, the, the day's adventure. And Esau would sit and talk about how he was out on the hills and how his his skill and cunning allowed him to do something that was daring. And his father would have a twinkle in his eye and say, tell me more, son. While Jacob talked about mundane things, how the beans were counted, you know what I mean, the, the accounting methodologies that kept the family running. Who wants to hear about that? He'd talk about things that had to do with the administration of the family. So mom, Rebecca, would, would, would incline her ear to Jacob, for he cared for those things. But Esau would catch his father's fancy. Now Esau, the eldest, should have had the birthright. But because he was a, a man with a flair, his ruddy skin and his hairy texture given to the outdoors, this man was not inclined to think that he should close himself in with the responsibility of doing what God says. Now, I, I say that with tongue in cheek because I believe that the greatest adventure in life is serving God. But you must remember that I am not a young man anymore. I talk now from experience. When I was a young man, I, I listened to the people who were part of the church, and I must tell you something. Sometimes you folk give young folk the impression that the joy is out there, but all that's in here is, is, is being, being faithful and, and being true and, 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 and just holding on. We got to change that. There's joy in serving Jesus. In fact, looking back on this story, the great adventure was not out on the hills catching animals. The great adventure was the coming of Jesus in the family. The great adventure of the enterprise was not trapping animals for food. Food is incidental to this story. But I believe that sometimes we who claim we love God give the wrong impression about being in the church. We make it seem like being in the church is boring. When the fact is that being in church is downright exciting. <laughs> I've been a pastor now for almost 30 years. I can promise you it gets exciting. Every dramatic scene you can ever imagine is played out in the church. <laughs> if you want joy, how many know we've got joy? 
And then there are times when there's sadness. God gets the opportunity to hold the blessing off until we run out of resources. He waits until the propitious moment and then allows his hand to reach in just in time. And just in the moment when you thought there would be no way out, God brings a way out of nowhere. <laughs> I love serving Jesus. Sometimes when I fly, I, I make the parallel. There are people who claim that the church is, is, is problematic because the ride is no longer smooth. <laughs> there are some folk who think that when you come to Jesus, somehow all of your problems ought to evaporate and uh, everything ought to be smooth from then on. But, but if you read through the Bible, you don't get that impression. In fact, <laughs> I read that, that Jesus did not always come to bring peace, but sometimes trouble, sometimes contention, sometimes family members will turn against each other. So just because the ride gets bumpy doesn't mean you ought to get off the ship. I fly all the time, and you can imagine that there are times when the ride is not so wonderful. But I've learned that it's better to be on the plane, no matter how rough it gets. I have now had the wonderful experience of being on a cruise ship. My, my wife finally... Uh, she came up with the nerve. She, she's not from a place where there's water. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. We are surrounded by water. So water is second nature to me. But uh, my wife finally agreed to go, and we got on one of those big ships. Turns out that the ship doesn't move. They've got all these gyroscopes on it and all these things to hold it still. But still, every now and then, there will come some winds that make you concerned a little bit. You're out on the deck, and all of a sudden, the beautiful sky turns ugly. But I've noticed that no one runs for the lifeboats. People run to their rooms. They don't try to get off the big ship. They climb to the middle of the big ship. Maybe we ought to do that in the church. Instead of going for the edge and trying to jump off, maybe we ought to climb to the middle. <laughs> the, the, the situation is, is one now that draws us into the picture. For here we have a family caught around this food. You know now that the mother is inclined towards Jacob. You know that the father is inclined towards Esau. And there comes a time now when Esau has expressed that he doesn't want to be bound in by all these responsibilities. He must have heard some of the old members talking or maybe some of the young members talking. And he doesn't want to be bound in by this. So he's obviously expressed it to Jacob. You know, you, you like all that kind of thing, but I'm not, I'm not into that, this birthright thing. All I want maybe is the power but all of this stuff about spiritual concentration, eh, that's not for me. So one day when uh, Esau comes back from the hunt, Jacob must have been a fairly good cook himself. So as he stirs the red lentils and puts the garlic in, well, let me get into this. You know, yeah. Cutting the garlic in around a little bit, a little onion, squeeze a little clove in there, and you know that thing can get interesting after a while, and you got your rice somewhere, and perhaps he had just presented himself some of the food. Put the, put the lentils, the red lentils, over the rice. Don't you leave me. I ask you not to leave me. And now Esau appears. Evidently on this hunt there was no catch. <laughs> if there had been a catch, he wouldn't have been hungry. Now he comes famished. Jacob, what is that? I smell that way down the path. What is that you're eating? Well, you know, it's something I put together. <laughs> Are you interested? Yes, I'm, I'm famished. Give me some. Said, no, 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 this is for me. <laughs> well, don't you share it? No, 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 this is personal. I've seasoned it to my taste. This is not yours. And then Jacob understands that here is a moment that is full of opportunity. Something occurs to him. Maybe he can help God a little bit. For we find recorded that he is the one who ought to be above his brother. He 
is the one who deserves the birthright, the spiritual birthright in particular. And so maybe he made the decision that some of us make. Maybe God needs a helping hand. You've heard the poem, haven't you? God has no hands but our hands. And some people take that to strange and extraordinary lengths. And now he will help God. So he says, Esau, let me <laughs> strike a deal with you. You're hungry, I have food, you have a birthright, and you don't like it. Why don't you give me your birthright and you can eat now? What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, birthright doesn't mean anything to me. Maybe he even thought it was not so serious. But before he would eat, and if I had been Jacob, I would have presented it first. Get it all right. Now, before you do this, let me hear your oath. So oh, yeah, it's done. So now the deal is cut. It is, it is more than Jacob should have asked. It's a hard bargain. It's overreaching. It's more than should have been done. But Jacob rationalizes that he's helping God. Now time passes and now Isaac is about to give the actual birthright. And here comes the food again. This food is there, part of the culture, isn't it? So Isaac says to Esau, son, I'm about to give away the uh, birthright. Go and get me some of that venison. <laughs> you know how you do. Now Isaac is a, a blind old patriarch, but he wants that taste again. He covets the taste. I have discovered that as you grow older, you can't taste exactly like you used to taste. If you're not old enough yet, you don't understand it. But trust me, there are some tastes that I remember as a child that I cannot recollect now. I cannot put them back together because something has happened to the wiring. The sensory perception is, is missing something. There are things that I tasted as a child. I taste that very same thing now, and it doesn't compute exactly right but you always long for them. So now Isaac says, go bring some of that and, and let's, let's do this thing now. Well, it was overheard by the mother and she runs to get Jacob and says, son, we have a moment to do this. There is a window of opportunity. Let me cook up something. Jacob must have been a cook. Esau must have been a cook, but mother might have been the one to teach them all. So now perhaps it was not venison, the scholars suggest, Maybe she went and got something much less exotic, but seasoned it in the right fashion. And if you know your way with seasonings, suggest culinary experts, you can make amazingly small things taste grand. And so now she puts together this, this wonderful meal and says, let me cover you with the skin of animals so you are hairy like your brother. Put on his clothes so you have the wild smell of the outdoors. And now Jacob goes in, eats with his father, and waits until his father comes close. He says, your voice, son. But when he touches his hands, they are covered now with animal skin. And when he puts his hand around his neck, it has been covered with animal skin. And when he smells the clothing, though the voice is not right, the touch is correct. He does not trust his ears, but his touch, and thus he makes the error of blessing the one that he did not intend to be blessed, and yet watch to see that what God intends does come to pass. Even if it seems that human planning has overrun, God will have his way. Now, I suggest to you that God did not need the trickery of Rebekah. God did not need the plan of Jacob. We must learn how to be still and know that God is God. Too many people take to themselves divine prerogative, making themselves in the place of God when God will have his will done. In fact, you don't have to worry about somebody else taking your place and taking your power or taking your position. 
I read the other day in pre preparation for another sermon that the sun holds all the planets in their places by its magnetic power. Every planet is held right in the right place. And the only things that move around without any anchor at all are shooting stars. And they soon burn themselves out. So that if somebody seems to be invading your space, just wait a while. It's just a shooting star. And they'll soon be burned out. As long as you have a relationship with the S-U-N, who now is the S-O-N for us. If you have contact with God, God gives you your place and nobody can take it away. So that if somebody seems to be invading your space, just wait a while. It's just a shooting stop. And they'll soon be burned out. As long as you have a relationship with the S-U-N, who now is the S-O-N for us. If you have contact with God, God gives you your place and nobody can take it away. You have nothing to fear. In fact, even when it seems like nothing will work out in your life, if you trust God enough, God will bring it to pass. Jacob actually could have just sat back and said, well, Lord, in your own time, in your own way. The fact is that God cannot work his providence on our time schedule, first of all, because we don't know perfect time. <laughs> you know, we go around saying God moves in mysterious ways, and I think he does. The fact is that God moves in perfect ways, but our, our thoughts are mysterious. <laughs> the old folk used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he comes on time. The fact is that you may not think he comes on time, but his timing is always impeccable. God is always on time. And there are times when he waits until you and I can understand that we have run out of resources. It, it certainly should have been that Jacob should have had enough faith. But now we skip to an amazing situation. After the blessing had been gotten, Esau was angry. Esau said, I'll kill him. I think that's anger. That qualifies. We uh, look in our society today and I, I must say to you that I am shocked as you are that we have come to the place where people get angry over things that are much smaller than the thing we just described and they say I will kill. There must be in this society more respect for human life. And, and, and God is not pleased when those who cannot make life take life. Anger ought not to be given that much rain. But there are people today who, who for small things say, I will kill. This is not a small thing. This is a birthright. This, this has spiritual authority. This has implications that are far reaching. And Esau says, I will kill him. So now, when Jacob has gotten the thing that he wanted by trickery, he learns an important lesson that you and I should not miss. When you get it the wrong way, you won't like it. It, it, it's, it's so easy to think I can make it happen, but the best way is God's way. So he has it now, but the word comes. His mother says, look, I tell you what you do. You leave, and I'll send you word when you can come back. You know how Esau is. His temper is mercuric. He's up and down. He's mad, and then he's okay. Give him a few days, and he'll calm down. I'll send for but the days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months and Jacob has gone now with Laban and he has now labored for a wife that he loves and has been tricked. Remember that when you think you are the most devilish at schemes, you will always meet someone who is better. <laughs> huh? You live by the sword, you will die by it. What you sow, you will reap. The boomerang theory, one of my favorite preachers calls it, you cast it out, it will come back. So you must be careful how you treat others. It need not come back through them, it can come back through someone else. But it comes back. 
So now this man, Laban, says, oh, you want to marry Rachel? Rachel is the one with the pretty eyes. And he makes him work for seven years. And, and one writer says that the man loved Rachel so much that the seven years passed by like days. That's love. There are some marriages that don't last for seven years. This man worked for seven years, and it felt like days. And now he goes to take his wife, and they've covered her up, as is the fashion, some would suggest. And when she is uncovered, it is not Rachel with the pretty eyes, but Leah with the weak eyes. We're not sure what that means. Some say that it meant that her eyes were set differently. Some say that uh, she might have had some affliction I don't know exactly what it means, but if it's the wrong woman, it's the wrong woman. <laughs> I don't have time to preach about that, but you surely ought to make sure it's the right woman. <laughs> I'll preach on that one day, but tonight suffice to say that you ought to make sure it's the right woman before you move ahead with the plan. Huh? <laughs> so now he works again. All of this is happening when he was supposed to be gone for a little while. Now comes word, not from mother, but from God. You have lived with your guilt long enough. There are some psychologists and some psychiatrists who think that preachers dwell too much on guilt. They accuse us of being non-productive, counterproductive, that we ought not mention guilt. But I believe that guilt is there for a reason. You ought to know when you have done something wrong. The problem with us today is that we seem to be peopled with folk who can do wrong and feel nothing. No remorse. I watch these television programs and they highlight these individuals who have committed heinous crimes. And when they put them on television, their eyes are vacant. Their faces have no expression. They sit without moving as they are accused of things that you could not imagine on your worst day of life. And it is frightening to think that people can do such things and not feel anything. This man lived every day of his life knowing that he had taken what was not his in that situation. God could have worked it out, but he ran ahead of God. And every day of his life, not only did he live with his deed, but his deed connected with his name. And his deed served to ramifications that made his name more powerful and more disdainful to him, for he had now become what his name predicted. He was the deceiver. And every day of his life, he woke up carrying the burden of that guilt. And now God says, let me come into your life and straighten it out. It's time to go back and face it. It's time to, to cut to the chase. It's time to get the burden off your back because you cannot live like that and enjoy it. So now this Jacob with all of his, his family and his animals and the things that represent wealth turns to go back to his father's land and as he goes back and sees the hills rising in the distance, his guilt grasps his heart. And he wonders what it will be like when his brother Esau hears that he's coming back. Will he come to kill him? Not only that, but there was the influence of Satan. We talked about that a little bit already. But Satan will get you in trouble and then come and rub your nose in it. You can't tell him you didn't do wrong because he was there. He's the one who suggested that you do it in the first place. So he has dates, places, faces. He can remind you. He knows. You remember when we were, <laughs> well, you're in trouble now. You know, in fact, if I were you, I wouldn't try to get this thing straight. I just kind of stay where I am because you're going to have some serious trouble with my man Esau. Now Jacob goes, but as he goes, he prays. And he does more than pray. Now, you must listen to this. You've got to hear it carefully. I believe that just because you pray, it does not mean that you ought not do some other things that are wise. <laughs> when you walk up and down city streets, ladies, you can pray that no one will steal your purse, but 
Tuck it under your arm. Hmm? You know, God will protect you. But one of the greatest things that God has ever done for us was to give us a brain. <laughs> you know, just because I'm praying doesn't mean I'm going to let the purse fly all out. Right? In fact, I've come now to wear my wallet in a different place. It's not your business where that is. <laughs> I trust God, but I'm making some precautionary measures now because I understand that some people get confused about whose wallet is whose. I don't have much in mind, but I got a couple things that are dear to me, a couple pictures, you know, and I want to keep them. So, so there's nothing wrong with taking precautionary measures. Now watch this. Here is Jacob going home. He separates his family into two bands, but he does it for a reason. He has come to a place that he calls Mayanaim. Mayanaim suggests two bands but the commentators say that this was not his idea, but God's idea for God, when he told him to go home, sent two bands of angels to go with him. One band went before him and one came behind him. You know, I feel better just saying that. Sometimes we worry so much about what people can do to us when the fact is that if you rest your trust in God, God is able to put angels before you and angels behind you. Angels that excel in strength. They are ministering spirits sent forth to take care of God's children. And there when God said go back home, God did not send them alone. I'm so happy to know that if I am secure in the fact that God has sent me, that I can be sure that God will protect me. <laughs> now he goes back, but the, the bands, Mayanaim, the police suggests two bands, angels before, angels behind. Perhaps he mimics this and says, let me divide my family. I'll send one part of the family this way, one part of the family that way, so that if we get attacked, only one part of the family will be able to be destroyed while the other will know to make provisions and leave. Not bad planning. Then he puts his family on the other side of the brook Jabbok. And this brave man comes to pray alone falls down on his face and prays to God. Now, I am not about to suggest the way that you ought to pray, the method, the, the physical position that you need to take, but I believe that some prayers require a different posture. I pray while I drive. I hope you do too. I pray while I fly. I hope you do too. But those prayers are prayers in motion. But when I have something serious to talk to God about, there are times when all, I, I must be bowed before God. Jacob is prostrate before God. He is alone and praying, God, you must protect me from my brother. He has every reason to be angry with me. Protect me now as I go home. And while he's praying there and while Satan is tempting him with the, the feeling that you cannot be protected because you are in fact Jacob. You are one who grabs heels. You are a deceiver. You are a supplanter. How can God protect you? But God does not judge us by names that have not been given by him. God judges us by his relationship with us. And so God's relationship is not based on this name, but Satan suggests it. Now in the midst of that prayer, somebody grabs Jacob. Well, you know, in his mind, he knew who it was. It's Esau. Oh, no. All the provisions that I've made before Jacob came to this prayer meeting, he had sent messengers before, sent gifts, told him, tell, tell him, Lord Esau, say Lord Esau. And, and when you end your message, say your servant, Jacob. Let him know that I'm not coming to claim anything. I'm just, I'm just trying to come home. But no answer, no response came back. And perhaps the first thing that popped into his mind, it's Esau. And they began to wrestle. Well, it had been a long time since you can even imagine Jacob and Esau as little boys wrestling. And perhaps there was some idea about the strength. I have one brother, and I confess to you that we wrestled and did everything for many years. 
fact, it took us ages before we got to be good friends like we are now. And I came to understand the level of his strength. There were times, he is my younger sibling, and all of you know that the older sibling must win. It's a rule. And there were times when I had to think of different strategies to win because his strength surprised me. But I, I had then a pretty good estimate of what his strength was. And even now, as old as we are, I hope it doesn't happen, but should my brother come and grab me, I think I would still be able to detect some pattern in what he might do to me. So evidently, after a while, Jacob realized that this was not the Esau pattern. This was some serious confrontation. In fact, if you believe Hosea chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, that Jacob wrestled with God, then you must understand that when you wrestle with the angel who is the Lord, that it is not a match of physical strength. Because Jesus, as God, is omnipotent. So this is not a wrestling match that has to do with physicality. This is a match of faith. This is a grasping of faith. Here is a man who has been known by the wrong name, who has been locked into a pattern that was suggested by the name, and who has confirmed the negative aspects of the name by stepping ahead of God. Now he goes back to settle the accounts. And tonight, as he wrestles, the desire of his heart is that he might rise above this name that has haunted him, this reputation that has stalked him, and that he might be somebody else who he really wants to be. And so his desire is not so much now to protect himself, for somewhere in that night, Jacob recognizes that this is not Esau. This is way more powerful than Esau. Whatever this being is, is not applying full strength. What must it feel like to take hold of the angel who is the Lord? He knows that whatever this being is doing, this being is not applying full strength. Somewhere, in the eerie gray of morning. Have you ever prayed till that time? There's a strange time that comes before light. And there's a strange gray. This being, this angel who is the Lord says, day is breaking, turn me loose. But by now Jacob knows who it is that he holds. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm tired of being supplanter. I'm tired of being deceiver. I'm tired of being known by what I did when I was being born. I'm tired of being followed by a reputation that, that was one moment in my life. I want to be free from that. I want to be part of a grand enterprise. I want to be part of a family that brings forth the savior of the world. I want to be on the positive side of life and not always considered to be on the negative. And if you think I'm going to let you go, my faith will not release you. Then says the Bible, the angel who is the Lord touches the whole of the hip, just touches it. Jacob must have felt something like a jackhammer that turned there. He felt the pain, excruciating though it was. He said, I've got enough strength left to hold on. Can't fight anymore, and I'm going to hold on. Now, folk, it was not physical strength that was holding now. It was the power of faith. And what I want to say to you what I want to say to me is that our faith, weak though it may seem, is sufficient to hold God to his promise. God has not dealt with us according to what we desire. If he had, I would not be standing in this pulpit. 
God has dealt with us with his mercy as well as with his justice. And if his mercy were not equal to his justice, woe be unto me. But my faith can take hold of him. Come boldly to the throne of grace, the Bible says. I can go boldly, not in my name, but claiming the merits of Calvary. I can go in Jesus' name. So if in faith I take hold of him, then he cannot let me go, even though I may be wounded in the process. And Jacob is wounded now, but he will not go. And early in the morning, perhaps now as the sun is beginning to paint pastel on the eastern horizon, this being, this angel who is the Lord says, what is your name? Jacob, he says. Deceiver, they have called me. Supplanter, I've always been known. They, they talk about me for grabbing a heel, but that's not who I want to be. And this, this angel who is the Lord says, your name shall be Israel, for you have power with God and with man. And Jacob lets go, grabs his aching thigh, his hip, and hobbles to his feet. Tears may have been streaming down his face, but there was a gleam in his eye, for his name had finally been changed. Yeah. What don't you like about you? What have you carried all of your days? What have they pinned on you for as long as you've lived? What is it that they will not let you forget? Some mistake you made when you were a teenager? Something you did when you were in your 20s? Something that you became known for when you were a child and they won't let you forget it. You can do all the good for the rest of your days, but somebody will come and remind you, I remember you. I remember you used to live over there. Didn't you? and it crops up again. God's promise to us tonight is that he has the power to step into your situation, change your name, change the way that you're known, and make you into a new creature. And the change occurs when God steps in. Tonight, it is my determination that I will not trust in what you think of me, I will go instead to find out, God, can you make a difference? You know, I, I, uh, I go back to my own hometown and there are some people there who are old enough to know me from a child. And if I were to tell you that I was perfect from a child, you wouldn't believe it and you would be correct in that assumption. There's no perfect human being on the face of the earth. And you know, I, I can find some of those old folk who can say, boy, I remember when you used to. I got them now, though. I tell them, you remember that little boy you used to know? Yeah, I'm not him. I know I look like him. In fact, got the same name, far as you know. But God has made a change. When God makes a change, that's the authoritative change. So then you can write about me in your news magazine. You can put people who look like me on television and always have me in handcuffs. You can describe me on the covers of your news magazines and make people think that I am something that I'm not. But in my heart, I will not accept your description of me. For I've learned that God is the one who makes me who I am. And when he comes into my life, he can change me. So you keep your perception. I'll take mine from God. In fact, there are those who, you know, those sports figures, and, and I have such empathy for them because all they do is make a living by some grand gift to play some ball game. And they say, don't make me a hero. I'm not your role model. And I agree with you, sir. I agree with you, lady. You are not my role model. My role model is Jesus. And the, the way that I get changed is not by watching somebody leaping through the air with a basketball. As much as I love Michael Jordan, 
He's not my role model. The one who's my role model is way higher than that. My role model is not one that changes my, my perception of myself by gliding through the air, but it changes who I am when I wrestle with him in faith. When he steps into my heart, he can wipe out my history. I don't care what you think you remember. He can change my name. So when I take hold of him with a grasp of faith, I am changed by the power that God only has. Tonight, your opportunity is that you, no matter what they say about you, <laughs> you don't have to be who they say you are. You don't have to fall into the category that they paint you into. You don't have to be, because you're from the neighborhood doesn't mean you gotta be like everybody else. Because you're from the town doesn't mean like you gotta be everybody, like everybody from the town. You are not controlled by your situation. You can be changed by the power of God because God does not allow those who love him to be controlled by situations. God controls the situations around you. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 